My name is Rich Parker. Um, I'm 72 years old. Um, I began flying when I was 17 years old. Um, my family is involved in flying. My dad was a captain for United Airlines. My mom flew as a stewardess. They met each other there. Later on in life, my mom became a pilot. My brother has flown before. We're just all involved in it. My brother no longer flies, but uh, um, I just, it was, it, the funny thing about it is when I grew up, I, I just thought everybody's parents, you know, were <laughs> pilots and stewardesses, you know, because we visited a lot of his friends who were pilots from United Airlines, and we would go and have dinner over their places and stuff like that, and, they, you know, they're, they're all pilots, so it's like, it's like is, I guess everybody's a pilot, you know. <laughs> um, what drew me initially was my dad got me involved in flying a Cherokee 140, which is a, a, a single low wing plane uh, for passenger. And I acquired about 35 hours of flying time when I was um, uh, 17. And um, I decided to just kind of go away from that. I was still, you know, punk in, in, in high school and stuff like that. So. Um, but over the years, I had always thought, gee, it would be nice if I could fly again or something like that. So um, as it was, I started watching videos later on in my life when I was almost 60. It took me that long to get back to it, being a contractor my whole life and all that kind of stuff. Um, I uh, had the joy of you know, building and I was very busy during those years. But when I got down here to Arizona, um, I attempted to retire, but uh, money goes pretty fast sometimes. So I continued to work, but I also had this in the back of my mind that I wanted to fly. And I started watching these videos about ultralights. And the specific one that I was watching was from this guy who was from uh, somewhere in the desert area near, um, uh, I'm not sure exactly where it was, but of Southern California. And he had this plane called a, a Quicksilver Sport 2S with a single wing on it. And it was a training plane and he was an instructor. And so I started reading a little bit more about this guy and he um, was uh, training a lot of people and everybody that he trained had a lot of accolades for this guy because he was just the, the consummate you know, trainer when it came to paying attention to the, the other pilot who was next to him. So um, unfortunately, uh, I found out later on that he had uh, died in an accident, not in the same airplane, but a different airplane. But he was my inspiration for flying the ultralight as, a, as opposed to, you know, general aviation. I had kind of made a decision a long time ago that general aviation was something I really didn't want to get involved with. There's too much traffic, you know, in the larger airports, and I didn't have a desire to really go anywhere. I just wanted to get up there and fly and look around and see stuff and, you know, that kind of thing. And that's, that, was the, that was the basic general idea when I got involved in this, in this particular aircraft because they have limits, limits to them and we have limits as a, as a light sport category. Uh, we can't fly at night. Uh, we have limited amounts of fuel we can have on board. We can only carry one passenger, this kind of thing. We can't go in highly densely, densely populated areas and this kind of thing. And so um, we have restrictions, but they don't restrict me from what it is that I love to see out there and do. And that's, that's just the, you know, that's just the joy of flying. And then I just went on a search for airplanes, you know, on, I don't know what the site is called, but, uh, and I found several and I checked them out and they didn't work out. And I finally found one in S Hilton Head, South Carolina, of all places. Couldn't have been any closer, but you know, it was pretty far away. So I made an agreement with the guy, da, 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 all that stuff. And then I flew back there. I had arranged to pick up a uh, Penske truck in the local town there and g drive over to the airport and pick it up. And we made the agreement, you know, and it w wasn't really looking the way I thought it was gonna look. It had a lot of rust on it. And, and well, I turned out that, I, f I found out that he had tanked it in the bay there at Hilton Head Island. It had uh, floats on it. He had broken one of the floats and so, it had salt water on it and everything, and things had, things had rusted up a little bit. So when I bought it, he had changed it out to regular wheels on it, 
for a trike configuration. And so we disassembled it there, loaded it into the truck. I screwed everything to the walls of the truck and strapped it down and all this kind of stuff and then pr proceeded on, I don't know, 2,000 mile drive, you know, across the country. I mean, Texas alone took me a whole day to cross. I was amazing. Um, but I finally got it here and got it over to the location where I was going to store it and all that kind of stuff. And uh, the guy unloaded it for me and we were going to do a little bit of work on it. And what it turned out to be is maybe a month, month and a half of changing out almost every bolt and screw on the whole airplane. And it gave me the opportunity to learn about the airplane because I had all the, the manuals for it, for assembly, for you know maintenance uh, schedules and all that kind of stuff. And it was probably the most perfect thing I could have done as, a, as an aircraft owner is to actually take it apart and put it back together again. And so we finally got that done. It still had the single-sided wings on it and uh, got it done. And the guy there at the airport um, test flew it for me and made sure that everything was okay. And then I started uh, to uh, take lessons from uh, a very nice person there who was local to the area. Her name was Dawn. And she uh, stayed with me for uh, several you know, months learning how to fly this airplane. And it seemed like I was never going to get it, you know. But uh, that's kind of how I got started as far as picking that airplane. I knew it was the one I wanted because of the structure of the, of the struts on the, on the wings, which made it much more sturdy than the, the wired ones that you see with a, with a king post at the top of the engine. And it just seemed to me as though this thing is held together with wires. How am I, I, I don't feel comfortable with that. So that's why I got the one with struts in it and they're very sturdy and strong. So after 20 hours, I, I was able to solo. So I went and it's 15 hours of dual training and five hours of, I'm sorry, five hours of, of solo after the 15 hours. But I, after that 15 hours, I went ahead and, and soloed. And uh, she was there with a the radio down on the ground with me and everything. And I passed with flying colors, I guess, and then went and soloed uh, uh, for another 80 hours. And it, I, they thought I was out there probably every day flying that plane, but uh, I think the guy at the airport said, you're flying the snot out of that plane, you know. <laughs> I said, well, yeah, I just want to, you know, by the time I take my test, which is you have to do it with an FAA official um, examiner, by the time I took my test, I was just taking it from, for a ride. I knew the plane backwards, forwards. I'd landed it in the bare spots in the desert all over the place, flew around every mountain you can imagine out down there. And I just knew the airplane. And uh, it was a very, very safe environment to learn how to fly this plane. Now, as a result of that, of course, with my training, I did a lot of ground school as well. And so you learn a lot about what you can and what you can't do, where you can go, where you can't go. So um, these kind of things, you know, were always in my mind when I got, was going to get my license. And so um, I, th I think that those, those are the basic differences. I needed 35 hours or 40 hours actually to get a license in a general aviation plane, which I never got. And of course I said earlier, I only needed 20, so for the other one. The difference between the two airplanes that I did fly, the uh, Cherokee 140, um, obviously it had a cockpit and it was enclosed and all that kind of stuff. And the difference between that one and mine is that there is no cockpit for mine. You're uh, in a lawn chair in the sky. It's like you're driving a motorcycle, you know, with wings. So it's like, 
it's so much different than the other airplane. The training difference was obviously with a general aviation airplane, I'm looking to be able to fly this anywhere I want to go and at night. And so I didn't get to any night flights at all during my training with that. Uh, I only had 35 hours of flying time before I kind of had shifted, you know, things that I was going to be doing in, in my life at, at 17, being a quarterback for the high school football team and all that stuff. But a true, a true ultralight, I don't have to have a license. I don't have to have a medical. I don't have to be trained. I can fly it by myself and be out there as a, as a rogue pilot. But the airplane has to weigh less than 254 pounds, can only seat one passenger, and I can only have six gallon tank on board. I can't fly at night. All these kinds of things are similar to the other ones as well. The, the, the flying at night I can't do in, in, a, in, a, in a sport pilot either. And so the difference between the, 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 uh, the ultralight and a light sport or sport aircraft is that I have to be certified, I have to have a license, all this kind of stuff, and I can carry a passenger. The true ultralight, you can't. So hopefully that kind of di di differentiates the difference between the two. And I think to clarify the reason why the word ultralight is used, and I, I even have it when I, I, I use it when I tell people, yeah, I'm an ultralight pilot, you know, because of the fact that they're not gonna understand what a light sport or a sport pilot is versus a general aviation, all this kind of stuff. Because in our category, the open cockpit does not determine whether it's a, a, an ultralight or not, or a sport pilot, because they have close, close uh, cockpit airplanes that look just like an airplane, but they're still in our category. Because they can only seat two passengers, they can't fly at night, da, 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 all these things. So if you love to fly it, it's not hard to maintain it because for one thing, you want to be safe up in the, up in the air. And, and the three things that you really need to know is your training is one thing and the maintenance on the airplane is the other and the weather is the last thing. Those three things are, are how you stay safe in the air uh, all the time. So uh, the maintenance is, is, uh, is something that is is spelled out for us in the manuals of when we need to do things, when we need to check things. And to a certain degree, it's like, it's like you're checking all these things, but if it's not broken, don't fix it, so to speak, is, is kind of the way, the way it goes. Um, but there are certain things that have to be changed. And like I just have gone through an engine rebuild. And so every 300 hours for a, a two-stroke engine, um, that, that is the type of engine that I have, it's a, it's a, um, a Rotex, 582, 65 horse, two stroke engine. It has to be rebuilt every 300 hours and has to be done by a qualified mechanic and all this kind of stuff. So um, these type of things are just required. They're not, they're not cheap. They're not, you know, it, it costs, costs a good penny to do that. But if you want to fly an ultralight airplane, you're going to be so much less expenses than you would if you're doing a general aviation airplane because you've got to pay a mechanic to do all these things. Being that it is home owned and it's a, an experimental aircraft, I can do a lot of the things on the aircraft myself. Once a year, I have to have uh, an inspection done by uh, uh, a, a DOR, and that's the, the guys who do the checking for you. They're FAA certified. And so they check my airplane once a year. I'm checked out every two years by an instructor and my same instructor has been coming back and, and performing that that for me as well. So, along with the maintenance, I've got to, I've got to have maintenance too, you know. And that's like see if I've got any you know bad bad habits or anything like that. So, uh, those are the things that I think that are probably important about what's different between the, the two aircrafts that I've done is that I can work on it by myself. The pre-flight ritual is the most important thing you can do because you're not in the air <laughs> for one thing, you know, trying to figure out what went wrong or what's going on with the airplane. Um, it actually starts with the post flight from the previous flight to check and see if there's anything that's fallen off the airplane, loose, this kind of thing. Uh, your wires uh, to the ailerons, uh, to the rudder and your control to the elevators in the back. Um, so you check that after each flight, and then when you go to do the pre-flight, there's actually a little card that I use to go through all of those details of, you name it, you know, checking the oil to the fuel, 
uh, all these things are, are part of it, and along with the things that I mentioned before. Check your tire pressure and all this kind of stuff. Um, check the starter, see that that's working and everything. So, because if you ever go somewhere and you, and you, you start the airplane or whatever, when you're gonna take off and go somewhere, if, if it, first of all, that should be something that's part of your general uh, maintenance program is the starter. Because if I go somewhere and I stop the airplane, I can't start it, I'm stuck there, so. Let's consider a pre-flight a walk around. Okay, so it's not something that I just, you know, look like this from one position. Um, I walk around the airplane and I open up the wings to take a look at where all of my aileron wires are connected, make sure that all the tie wires are there, and there's a zipper on my wings since they're made out of a fabric, and I open it up, look inside. If it's dark, I try to get a light or something in there, but usually it's not dark because I've got the, the doors to the hangar open by then. And, uh, or I've got it outside, you know, one of the, one of the two. Um, uh, if it's a little colder or something, I'll do the pre-flight inside, but, but during the summer times, nobody do. Um, so I'm walking around the airplane and there are certain things in regards to checking things by moving them. I've got to move my elevator. I've got to move my ailerons back and forth. I've got to check the pedals for the rudder, which coordinate my turn. All those things um, have to be checked before you go. And uh, uh, so, I don't know, that's, that's kind, of, kind of what I'm dealing with every, every time you fly. Uh, you sometimes you check the, on a, not on a regular basis, but you check the pressure of what it takes to poke a hole in your, in your wing also. There's a little tool that you use, and you do it in a very inconspicuous place that wouldn't matter if you have a little dent or something in your, in your, in your, uh, your wing fabric. But it's a way to test it to see if the sun has started to attack it. Weather is a big factor. I've got a, a little pole on my runway. I don't have a sock yet. If anybody wants to donate one, that'd be great. <laughs> as, as, a, as a gift. No, I'm just joking. But, um, I, have, I have these ribbons that hang off of it, and they, they, they will actually indicate very, very light wind. And sometimes the lighter wind is the one that can be dangerous because it'll gust after that. And so I watch that while I'm doing my pre-flight, while I'm getting the, the, you know, the airplane ready, and while I'm getting back to where I taxi to take off, I can still kind of see it from where I'm at back there. And it's also visible from the air too. Um, but the wind is a big, big factor in flying an ultralight airplane. We have restrictions on crosswind landings of 15 miles an hour for my specific airplane. For me as a pilot, I say 10. I don't want to land in a 15 mile an hour crosswind. But you take off in the morning, you fly for maybe an hour, things can change in an hour. So those are things that you have to be aware of that's gonna happen. There's not much I can see, but I can feel it, okay? The other factor that is a really safety issue is that I love flying around mountains and flying low, okay? so. If you've watched any of my videos, you know, on the YouTube channel, you will, you will see that that is a love of mine. But I want to put this out there for any new pilot or any lesser experienced pilot. I'm not saying I'm not the most experienced pilot there is, but I've been doing this for 10 years. And I've been flying around mountains. I've been flying out in the desert where you've got the hot sun heating up the ground after 10 o'clock in the morning, creating updrafts getting to the other side of the hill where there's a shadow and having a downdraft come and just knock you down like nobody's business. So I've been doing this for so long that when I actually get up in the air and I get close to a mountain, I don't come right up to it below the height of the mountain, I come down to the, to the mountain. So if there is anything that, that hits me, I can veer off in any direction and go away from it. I never do anything where I'm trying to climb over a mountain to begin with when I don't know what the situation is. Just based on the fact that I could get thrown down and thrown into that mountain on the shadow side. So um, those particular factors are a big, big safety for me. And I've mentioned it in a lot of my videos, you know, even, even with words on the screen, I said, you know what, we got dead air today, you know, and dead air to me means that I'm gonna get sucked down somewhere or I'm gonna be blown up somewhere. I think the key to 
to my excitement about flying the Sport 2S, which was different from regular aviation planes, is that I'm, I can go places, but you know, not very far away. I have a 12 gallon tank in my, in my, and I burn five gallons an hour, and I have to have a half an hour of fuel on board before I, I land. I can't be flying it in, in, on, you know, on fumes. I have to be, be careful of that. So about an hour and a half flight is about all I can really do. I can always take some fuel with me and, and uh, stop and pour another five gallons in and I can carry it in my seat next to me if I want to. But um, some of the most memorable ones were the, like my flight to, to, uh, uh, to Phoenix. The trip to Phoenix was um, very early in my flight uh, experience in an ultralight, maybe a year, maybe a year and a half into it. And I had, had a lot of confidence back then. And, but anyway, I went to visit this guy by the name of Rob Kabaski, which uh, I turned out has turned out to be, even just to the two days that we were in it together, flying together, three or four flights a day, no, I'm sorry, two or three flights a day, because we, uh, we had to eat, we had to get gas, you know, all the time. Um, he took me all over uh, a lake up there and some mountaintops and things, and we made 10 videos out of the two days that I spent with him. This was probably the most memorable. We actually contact each other every once in a while uh, by PM or whatever on, on, on Facebook, or, or I, I have someone where we, we call each other. And uh, we had cameras on both planes, so I would switch back and forth, and it was my first attempt at editing back in that, those days. And uh, we look back on it and say, God, I can't believe we, what we did that back then. And it was, it was just amazing. And as a result of that experience with him, um, the two of us still uh, are just totally amazed and totally enamored with that experience. Because I've never experienced anything like that really since with another pilot that was as crazy as I was, <laughs> if you want to go that far. During that time, I just it was bogged down with the driving and I wanted to have my own airstrip. And I didn't know how that was gonna happen. But it's not one of those things where, okay, you just buy a piece of property and you know you, you get somebody out there to grade it and all this kind of stuff. I spent years looking at locations online for prop, raw property and this kind of thing, you know, and stepping off, you know, the distances and whether or not I was capable of having that, that on there and if there were too many people nearby or whatever. I did this for several years. I would take my wife and, and drive out to the middle of the desert and places, you know, and drag her out there. But I, I had seen a piece of property kind of early on that was actually only 20 minutes from our house that we rent here in Green Valley. But um, it was that piece of property that, that I was just like, how am I gonna do this? You know, how am I gonna build a, an airstrip on here? But the location being only 20 minutes away, it, it was, was so much of an attraction for me. And then when I actually moved from the Marana airport to another airport, which which uh, my buddies were at, and we were all moving away from that airport, from the original one, was over in Whetstone near Tombstone. And, and not that everybody knows too much about Arizona, but we're just south of Tucson here. And in order to get to that area, I gotta go around a mountain and out to the freeway and then back around the other side. And there, another hour and 15 minute drive each way to get to that one. So the same thing was happening, but I had already purchased the property at that particular time. So it was in the works. I had, you know, some wheels rolling on it. It was just a matter of time before I could get started on it. And so I actually had to get a set of plans drawn and uh, brought my, my buddy from, from college who's uh, an architect here in town over. And his name is Bill Gansline and I love this guy. He was a fraternity brother of mine and all this kind of stuff. But he drew up some plans for me. I took it to the city and 
to, uh, actually to the county, it's a Pima County down here, because we don't deal with the city here, you just deal with the county because it's out in county property. And uh, gave them the plans and they, they approved it, paid my fees and all that kind of stuff. And with, you know, talked to them quite a bit about it, you know, that this is, you know, I'm just building a runway out here and I'm gonna probably build a hangar and a, and a, and a house eventually, you know, but I wanna build the runway and then do the hangar and then the house. There wasn't a whole lot for me to engineer on this thing because the first guy that I had come out and take a look at it was, a, was an excavator guy or a backhoe guy or whatever. And, he had, and I wanted to put the runway on this one side of the property. And he said, well, that's a lot of you know, dirt moving and all that stuff. Why don't you do it over here? Do it this direction, the way it ended up. And I went, oh. He says, yeah, you're gonna take some, take some dirt out of there, but it's gonna be a whole lot easier than it would be the other way. And that's, that's what I took to my friend and he drew up the plans for the new location. And when I went to, the, oh, I have to say this, I had to, ha I had to have a, a meeting with my neighbors, contact them, schedule it in a time frame with, which would be logical for them to be actually show up at the county and have a hearing that I'm gonna do this, okay? And so the original location was this, and then I had, once I changed it, I had to have another hearing. And it was like, oh my God, what am I doing here? But it had to go in this new location, it couldn't go in the other location. So. Um, I have to backtrack just a little bit because before all of this, I looked up in the statutes for, the Pima, for Pima County for this area and the zoning of the property that I purchased. And I don't know if I lucked out or I, I really can't remember if I had known ahead of time, but it was zoned RH, which means Royal, Rural Homestead, Rural Homestead. And I looked up all of the information about rural homestead. And I get all the way down, all the way down. And I finally look in, in it and I go, oh, you have the ability to put an ultralight landing strip on that property if it's more than five acres. And it was a six acre plot. So I am sanctioned by Pima County to go ahead and build an ultralight landing strip on my property that I just purchased. How, how crazy was that? When I took those plans into the, into the county, they said, oh, wait, wait, you, you, have to build, you can't have, you can't have a, a, a structure out there without having a house. And I'm going, uh, yes, I can. You told me I could. Why would I build an, a landing strip and then come in to build a hangar and have to build a house first before I do that. Why would I ever build the, the runway in the first place? I would have said, no, I can't, I can't do that. You know, it has to be progressive. And so they got back to me and said, well, we, we're, we're, allow we're allowing you to have that stipulation. They, they allowed me because, because they knew eventually I, I, I would build a house and all this kind of stuff. I mean, it was, and I'd been, they, they knew me like, you know, their, their next door neighbor because I've been in there so many times dealing with this thing. So it was a long process of the design and, the, and all this kind of stuff. But once we got started, all I really did was kind of cut down some cactus and kind of get ready for the guy coming in with the heavy equipment. So, and you know, I was out there on, on a, regular basis, you know, watching how it all happened. And it took about a month to, to do it all. And, and uh, oddly enough, I ran into some guys who were uh, Pima County maintenance, road maintenance people that keep, you know, extra dirt and things, you know, kind of on the way out to my hangar. And they use that to fill in for erosion and stuff when, when the monsoons come. And, and I, said, I said, you know, I got a lot of dirt <laughs> out of my property that we took down from this mountain. You guys want it? The guy said, well, yeah. They brought out over two days, four loader, uh, one loader, one loader to load the dirt, four trucks, dump trucks, huge dump trucks. And there's plenty of room to get in there. There's access. I had a, I've had a, a semi truck out to my place to, for the, uh, uh, for the, uh, case 1150 uh, bulldozer that we used on the project. So there's plenty of access for that. For two days, they rotated these four trucks in there and loaded them up and took the dirt away. 
We still kept a little bit for maintenance purposes and all that kind of stuff, but they must have taken out thousands and thousands of yards of dirt out of there that was kind of left over on the runway that needed to be cleared, and then we did the final grading after that. But uh, it, those are the kind of the challenges that I had in regards to building the, the runway that um, had I known ahead of time, you know, I might have questioned it a little bit, but uh, you know, as it unfolded, you just take care of it, you just do it. The, the construction of the, of the runway took an inordinate amount of time to do because this bulldozer goes so frickin' slow you know, that it's like this. It seems like it's taken forever just to move the dirt. And you take the dirt from one end of the runway and move it to the other. And it just, it just seemed like it was, it was very time consuming. And I was burning up, you know, money like crazy uh, because we had to keep the, the case 1150 uh, uh, longer than we had designed in the past. And then, I mean, at the beginning. And so um, it cost me more money to actually do that. And that was kind of a, uh, you know, money's a big factor, you know, when you're doing something for, for your fun, you know, kind of thing. Um, the drainage after the actual runway was, was very close to being done. I had to put a culvert across from one side of the, of the runway to the other to go into one of the natural uh, washes that was near there. And uh, that was not a big challenge. I had gotten the materials from a local excavation company that had some left over in their yard, and I got a discount on those and stuff, so. After the runway was done, you know, uh, I could, I still can't bring my airplane there. It's going to be sitting outside. So we built it. We built the hangar, and of course, I had the designs for it myself, and and had the guy, you know, design it, uh, set some plans for me. And so we got that built, and a lot of the work done on the hangar was was by hand. I dug all the footings by hand, and and uh, I found a concrete guy at Home Depot, you know, and got his crew to come over there, and got a pretty good deal on that. And, so um, once it was all done, I had actually done the framing myself and all that kind of stuff up until the point where they hung the, the header and the trusses that, that carry the load of the roof. I had that done by a framing crew. But I had church members come over and help me tilt up the walls. I would build them and they would help me tilt them up and we secured them and everything, all that stuff. And I just wanted to kind of pay people back, you know, for that. And when we had some finally some decent weather, you know, towards the end of this year, since I'd, I'd already brought my, pla brought my plane over there and everything. Um, and it was in, in the hangar and it sat there for a long time before we got the garage doors on and everything, the hangar doors on it, which I had planned and, and designed myself. Um, once it was all done and we just kind of got some time, you know, to do this, I scheduled a, uh, a party. It was, it was, it was in my mind to have a party or a grand opening. Okay, was what I called it for the hangar. And it's kind of strange, you know, it's a hangar. It's, a, it's not a, it's not a business. It's not a restaurant or anything like that. But I wanted people to come out there who I know and people that I actually had help me on it. You know, be rewarded by a little party. You know, out there for a grand opening. And then I had a flight demonstration and all that kind of stuff. It was hotter than Hades that day. But um, my wife and I went to Costco and bought a bunch of food. We had a porta potty out there, you know, uh, had the generator working for the refrigerator and all this kind of stuff, and and um, and put a bunch of chairs and tables and stuff inside the hangar because it was like 105 degrees out there at, at like nine o'clock in the morning almost. And I was going to go from like nine to twelve or something, and and. By the time 10, 10.30 came along, it was getting really hot. And so most everybody was, was gone by 11.30. But at one point, we had almost 50 people out there who had come to acknowledge the fact that I wanted to share with them what I had accomplished and uh, provided out there for the airplane and uh, show people what I did. I really love flying low. <laughs> But it, 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 I believe it's kind of exciting for people to, to see that, that this type of flying is possible. Once again, if you don't have that ability in yourself or you're not experienced enough to do it, please, you know, be cautious with what you're doing. Um, I've been doing low flying ever since I can imagine. 
And it's one of the things that ultralight pilots do. I mean, we fly low so we can see stuff. We love to see the scenery. We love the rock form. I love rock formations. I love flying over mountains that have great rock formations. Um, some of my experiences with the ultralight uh, in those situations do have some wind factors to them. And once I've determined whether it's not up or down and it's just it's coming sideways, I've experienced some times when my airplane actually is like a helicopter. <laughs> I know that sounds strange, but I'll just come to this little mountain area and there's some wind blowing, you know, and I love the view that I'm seeing and all of a sudden it's like, I'm getting a longer view of this <laughs> scene than I would normally do because the airplane is just kind of not stalled, it's just flying with wind going over the wings and, and, and so it's, it's still flying. It's just, I'm just not going anywhere. <laughs> and I, I like those types of things, you know, that, that um, are safe, first of all. I have to keep reiterating that I have to be safe in these situations. I'm not flying real low to the, to the mountains at that time, but those things really are, are quite fun to do. And while I'm doing it, I, I'm going, this is gonna look really good on video, you know? <laughs> After a while, I started seeing some other videos, you know, and, and a lot of my videos were looking all the same. And I'm going, well, what if I could be flying along and turn the camera to go over here or actually rotate it all the way around in a circle and look behind me while I'm, while I'm flying, you know? Or it got to the point where I, I, I had to be real careful about being a cameraman or a pilot. Which one am I gonna be? But what I devised is I found a couple of items in the electronics store. One was a, 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 a two RPM motor that was run off of uh, 12 volts and a, a switch that would allow me to go left or right and would, would toggle back to, to stop when, without me you know, having to, to deal with it. And so I just, and the camera being up off to my, to my right front, that was the front camera. I had one behind me as well. Um, I left just, just left that one for straight so I could edit things like that. But the one up here, I built a little th thing to hold the motor and, and extend it out from the framework of the airplane. And I tested it and all this kind of stuff and then did some tests in flight and all this. And I thought, Whoa, this is really cool, man. I love the way it works. And as a result, now this is another thing you have to be really careful with is if you're a pilot and you're, and you're, you're trying to be a, a videographer at the same time, you got to pick, you know, you either got to take somebody along with you to do that. Or with me, I had the switch right next to my throttle. So I was able to do everything without having to move my hands from anything that I would do normally to, to operate the airplane. And any time when I was changing positions or moving the camera, this kind of thing, I was away from anything that would be, you know, uh, abruptly change my, my speed <laughs> by running into it. So, I devised this thing and I started to use it and it, it actually changed the way I, I fly. I do a little bit of planning sometimes. I know kind of how things work when it comes up to a, to like um, one of the, the local mountains that's right there is called Helmet Peak. I'll rotate the camera around and do a circle around the mountain and it faces the mountain the whole time and then I'll rotate it back around when I switch sides and it gives the it gives the the impression or the the it it gives it how do I want to say that it act, it actually gives you a, a a view of things that you might never have seen before and so a lot of the things that I've been doing that lately have been involved with the the turning camera one of the, the things that I enjoyed probably the most when I, um, when I got involved with, with some other pilots was when we flew to a dry lake and it's kind of east of Vail and Benson, Arizona, if you're familiar with those areas, and there's a dry lake out there. And so I've got the slowest airplane of the three people that were, that were going out there that day. And so they're all waiting for me and all this kind of stuff. And so. But I, know, I made it. They, they basically do little circles around me and stuff like that. <laughs> you know, here I am going 50 miles an hour. And they're, they're all going like 100 miles an hour sometimes. So, but still in the cat, life support category. But we all landed th at this place and we had a great time that day. And that's a memorable experience for me, again, of, I, I think it's, it, 
if you don't have anybody to fly with, go find somebody to do it. You know, it's, it, it's, it's, even if it's just a couple of times here and there, you know, because you can plan stuff and go land someplace. I know a lot of people that go actually in camping, you know, in their planes and they have a place where they can land or whatever. It's near some airport or something. I don't know. But that's not something that I'm interested in doing overnight stuff. But when you go in and do a plan a, a half day trip or something like that, it's a lot of fun. One of the reasons I moved to Whetstone was because two of my friends from the other airport had had actually been maybe living closer to Whetstone, which is over by Tombstone on the other side of these, these this, this high plains area over on the other side of these mountains here. And they said, hey, come on over there, you know, well, you, can, you, you can hang out in our hangar. Uh, I eventually got my own hangar over there that somebody else had, was uh, storing an airplane in. And so, uh, because there were so many pe planes in this other hangar, there wasn't any room for me anymore. But um, just having somebody out there that every, because you know, they would fly on Sundays too, which was great, because I'd go out there on Sunday morning and there they'd be, you know, and we'd all like, you know, go to the refrigerator, get something to drink or whatever, and then maybe plan something for that day. A lot of time, I mean, there's a couple videos where all we did was fly around the airport there. One of them was a, um, was a one-seater and it's called a, a, an XL, I think is what it's called. And so this thing is a screamer. I mean, it's a, it's a Quicksilver, but it goes so much faster than mine. And it's, it's like, it is like a race car in the sky, which is the name of one of my videos too. I've done, done a, a video with uh, that name of it uh, because I was going so low through, the, through the, the mines and everything. But we did a video of him and I flying around the airport right there at Whetstone. And even one of the, the scenes or so from that got to the, favorites of 2022 for the turning cam. I don't know if I can explain it or not, but it, uh, basically we were flying side by side. He landed, I passed him and I turned the camera around and watched him take off again, you know? And then he came around like this and came in front of me and the camera caught him coming this way again. and. And that's on the that's on the compilation of the my favorites for the for the uh, turning cam, but those types of things, you know, uh, once again safety safety first. We're all we're on the radios. We know where everybody is. That we have a guy on the ground with a radio, saying, okay, he's you know he's he's still behind you or he's in front of you. When none of this was done with any kind of disregard for you know safety and. The Whetstone Airport is predominantly was we were the only pilots there. <laughs> there were several hangars there, but we were the only ones that fly out of there. So uh, there, there, I guess in the future began to be more pilots as, as after I left to come back to my own my own uh, hangar and runway. But um, I can't say enough about the fact that you got other people to fly with. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, gives you something to do too. You know, you're not just flying out over the desert for nothing. A lot of people have flying in their mind, but they, oh, there's no way I can ever afford that, you know? I mean, if you can buy a used car, you can buy, an, you can, you can buy a, an ultralight airplane. Same amount of maintenance is involved. You need a place to keep it, so there are places around that are not too expensive. If you want to learn to fly, there are people that can teach you how to do it and teach you the right way to do it, and it is generally a safe endeavor. It's not something that is totally dangerous and you should be totally afraid of it. If you're totally afraid of it, you're probably not going to be flying anyway. But if you have a hankering, like, like some people I know, if you have a hankering to, to actually learn how to fly, I suggest starting with an ultralight and then moving up to general aviation after that. And I wouldn't be surprised if people, you know, I think there should be a course for commercial airline pilots to fly an ultralight airplane with the controls and no instruments out of the, you know, like I have very limited instruments on my airplane. I mean, I, mean, I got an altimeter and, you know, airspeed and all that kind of stuff, but, and, you know, water temperature gauge, whatever. Um, but if they learn how to fly an airplane, they know how to slip an airplane. I've seen some videos of these guys that there was a, there was a, there was a guy that was flying an, an aircraft that they, they, they miscalculated the amount of fuel that was supposed to go into this commercial flight. And they ran out of gas two thirds of the way there. 
And he's flying on nothing, no instruments, no way to contact anybody. And he, act, he, he actually glides this thing down and finds an abandoned Air Force base. And you got to watch that video. It's, it's incredible. Because what he was doing was he had no way to control anything about how high he was or how low he was to a certain degree because he had to keep the airplane flying. There's a situation in aircraft that you can actually, what they call, slip an airplane. And by slipping the airplane, you can reduce your altitude, still keep the plane flying, slow the plane down so that you can lose a lot of altitude in a very little amount of time in order to make a runway that you look like you're going to be flying too long. And this guy did that. But a lot of commercial airline pilots, they don't know how to slip an airplane. They may, may have heard about it, you know, but nobody ever does that in a, in a in a commercial airline, I believe that they should they should have had some 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 training in a you know in a regular airplane. So, to those people who are looking to actually grow in their airplane, why not start off with a with an ultralight? You're going to be able to learn how to fly an airplane because my ultralight airplane is not one of those wing movements, uh, which is like the old style of hang glider. It's not one of those airplanes. It is a regular airplane with all the ailerons, the, uh, the rudder, and the elevator. It has all those things. The only thing mine doesn't have is flaps, but flaps are, are a, a very simple thing to learn how to use. So I, but that, that's my recommendation to people is that uh, start, start with an alternate light. You know? Learn how to fly by the seat of your pants. <laughs> that's, 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 you know, that's, that's, I think, the best way. I was flying around the, the airport over there in Whetstone, and it was a, a windy day, and it was it was questionable whether I should have been flying or not. But um, I was enjoying hovering, you know, and then coming down and landing. Unfortunately, you know, sometimes <laughs> when you're hovering, you have no airspeed, and so if you point it down so far, you're gonna, you know, you're not gonna have enough room to flare it out, and, and you don't have that ability to really land softly. And so I crunched it a couple times, but I flew around and uh, the pattern, and then came in again into that wind that day and um, I was wearing a helmet that had a, a brim on it and if you know if you have a brim and it, the wind hits it you know on your on your baseball cap or whatever it is it'll blow your hat right off well this one well I had a helmet on with this brim and it blew my head backwards and at the time I had had my magneto switches right behind me and when where I can reach them you know to do my my warm-up and check my mags but for some reason, they were so too close to my helmet and my helmet blew back like this and shut off both of my magneto switches. Now, I don't have an electronic start on that, so I have a pull start. I didn't know that that's what it was. I just thought I ran out of gas. And here I am <clears throat> pretty close to the airport, but I'm hovering. I'm not going anywhere. I ain't gonna make it to the runway if I point the airplane down. I cannot make it. And <clears throat> training, training has got to take over. It then you just, you, you know, I'm, you know, first of all, I think, oh, I'm screwed. You know, I'm gonna wreck the plane or whatever. I look over to the left. There's a little street there. There's a there's telephone poles to the left of it, so I know I can't go too far over that way. And I just aim the plane over in that direction. And I'm coming in, trying to trying to keep my speed up. And I come down, and I'm not, I'm not. The plane is not doesn't have enough speed really to to fly too well. But I figured, well, I'm just gonna you know hit the runway. I'm gonna hit the road pretty hard. And uh, I thought, okay, I got it. I got it. I got it. I'm gonna I'm gonna be okay. You know, and there's plenty of room for the wings and all this kind of stuff. I hit the ground, and the plane bounced about five feet in the air, and pulled it to the right. I went into a bush that was very, very stiff and hard and everything. And my front wheel and everything kind of got, you know, up onto the bush. And 
I mean, I'm okay, no problem, I'm fine, no, no problem with me. But I know that something might be wrong with the airplane. And so the guys, my friends, are actually videoing me from the airport as I'm coming in. And the last part of this, the, the, I never put this video on or anything, but the last part that I see on their film is that I'm hovering and all of a sudden I'm, I do this and I disappear. <laughs> Uh, it was it was probably the most dangerous thing that I have ever experienced in my airplane, um, aside from the low flying and you know flying around things. But when the airplane is is not working, and you have no you know the engines out, you know, and so I'm fine. I'm on the ground. These guys drive over. You know, there's streets to get over where I'm at because they saw me. And they, they knew exactly where it was, and they helped me pull the airplane out, and I'm just kind of trying to see if everything's working and everything. I said, well, bring, me, you know, I, I, they called me or something. I, can't, I think they called me on my phone. And, and I said, yeah, bring some gas. I think I ran out of gas. I'm going, I didn't run out of gas. I had full tank when I started. What was this all about? There's no way for me to get my airplane back to the airstrip because there's these gates and everything. They're just wide enough for a car. And there's no way to taxi it back over there or drag it over there. So I was like, I'll fly it out of here. I'll just fly it out off this road. So, so, so we, we, the guy pulls me with his car and all of a sudden he hits, he, I can't steer the thing because he's got the front wheel off the ground. So I can't steer it. I'm in the plane. He's towing me by his truck and, and I hit a sign. That's when I hit the sign was when, <laughs> when I was being towed and I said, whoa, 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 stop, 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 stop. You know, and I had to reposition, move the plane over, and, and I got onto the road, which was perpendicular to the one that I had landed on. And there was all kinds of wires and stuff all over the place, and I had to take off underneath one wire and then go up and, and over another one to get out of there, and then just one little quick little turn, and I'm off the beginning of the runway. And the guy says, you're going to do that? Yeah, no problem, you know. And so I'm getting the controls and everything, and it's you know kind of fuzzy, and it's not really working too well. Well, I look back at the axle, and I bent the axle on the, on the, on the, on the plane. And uh, what I didn't notice was that one of the parts coming from the rear wheels to the front had bent like this which controls the rudders and they were attached to that and so i didn't realize that so i got i said i said uh, let's fill it up with 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 um with fuel and let's get started and see what happens well i noticed that the magneto switches were off i went holy crap you know something happened when I hit my head back there because I knew that was, you know, it was like, boom, it was really hard. And I said to myself, I turned the magneto switches on because <laughs> they brought, they brought five gallons of gas and I got like, like maybe this much out of the five gallon tank to fill up my tank. It was already full. So uh, be aware of these kinds of things. This, this could have been avoided probably by the location of my magneto switches, which I ended up changing after that. I changed the location of the magneto switches. And the conditions were, were probably not favorable to flying my, the plane that day, and I made a bad, I bad, I made a bad decision. And um, that's the other thing that you have to be aware of is, yeah, I really want to go flying today, you know, but hey, it's, you know, it's pouring down rain or it's, the, the wind's blowing like, holy, crap out there you know do it another day you're not going anywhere you don't need to be anywhere flying so uh, here i am got the engine started we cleared the street <laughs> some cars a couple people came over you know to begin with are oh, you all right yeah i'm fine you know because the locals out over there and, and uh, so we cleared the street there's a guy behind me and there's a guy all the way at the end of the street. He stopped traffic, which no, there's no traffic out there anyway, but, and he said, okay, you know, he yells at me, okay, you know. So I just floored it, took off, went under the wires, 
and over the wires, came back down, and I'm having problems with the rudders. And I'm going, what's going on here, you know? The rudders aren't working well, yeah, oh yeah. So I'm having a problem with the water rudders, and they're just, it's not perfect, you know? And I'm going, well, I'm, you know, I'm just, I'm right over the end of the runway, so let's just go for it. So I came down in and uh, uh, crunched it again because I didn't have any speed. The wind was blowing right in my face. Crunched it again, got it on the ground, taxied it over to the to the hangar and put it away. And uh, it was the next day, or, or that after that, got it in there and investigated it. You know that, you know, I got to order some parts from Beaver Born, <laughs> the owner of Quicksilver. And I ended up, uh, you know, rebuilding it all myself and everything. But it was, uh, you yeah, know, cost me some money and and uh, uh, some time away from doing what I love to do. Initially, it was scary having your engine out and not knowing what to do about it, you know, or what happened. And then everything clicked in. There it is, there's your place, go there, you know. And you don't worry about what the outcome is gonna be. You gotta fly the airplane to that outcome. If you don't fly the airplane to the outcome, um, you're, you know, you're gonna be a basket case up there and, 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 and freeze. I mean, there are, pilots I'm sure that have frozen you know in the past but being that this was my fourth engine out uh, two of which I ran out of gas was my fault and I was right over the runway and everything I would just or right out right over a, a bare spot in the desert and I just landed the airplane one time I just pushed the airplane back to <laughs> the other time I called for a guy to, to pick up the five gallon you know tank of gas that I had in the back of my truck and fly it out to me you know because it was only just about you know a mile away from the airport um, but this one here was scary in that regard is that is that I had no idea what was wrong or anything and I just went into my basic training and just pointed you know they always say when it engine out point the airplane down even if you got wind in your face like crazy pointed it down got it down on the ground even though it did bounce blew that it blew my mind that it bounced like 15 feet to the right I I'm, 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 I'm landing the plane thinking, oh, I'm going to be okay. You know, I'll, I'll just have a hard landing. No big deal. Bounce. And it goes that far to the right was such, such a, I was astonished. Some, some kids from the church and they are a part of a, a, a what they call a pathfinder group at our church. I invited them to come out to the airstrip. We walked the runway and talked about aviation and this kind of thing. This is one of the things that I would like to, to continue. I'm not saying that I've done anything more than that, but in the back of my mind, I would like to approach um, elementary schools, maybe some troubled kids groups or whatever, and invite them to come out to the airstrip, you know, and get them away from all of the things that, you know, are distracting to kids these days. You know, leave your phones at home, all this kind of stuff. Walk the runway, look at the hangar, walk the airplane with me. I'll do a flight demonstration. Watch what it is that I do to get ready, you know, to do all these things. And maybe somewhere in there, there might be some inspiration for some kid, you know, that, that has gone, well, you know, like, I don't know if kids say this or not, but like, what am I doing with my life? I, I doubt that they do, but they just find themselves in, in, a, in a crap hole, you know, based on you know, what it is. Their parents, their, you know, the fact that they don't like school, the kids are bullied them. Who knows what it is? We don't really know. So I'm not elevating myself to say that, that you know, this is something that I'm going to do. But one of these days I would like to set up a little program where I can walk into a school and say, look, I have this program here. If you want to have bus some kids out there for the, for a, a morning or an afternoon, you know, on the weekend, you know, I'll, I'll gladly go through what it is that I do, uh, uh, as a, as a, as a light sport pilot and how, what the joy and the love of it is and maybe be able to inspire some kids who knows. Um, 
as far as that being something that would be a legacy for me, I, I don't know. Um, I look back, I think you have to include this, this YouTube channel that I'm involved with because of the fact that it has always been documentation, love of flying ultralights, but not sensationalism. If, if I do something where it's, I mean, you know, I've had some engine outs, you know, and things like that, and I've, I've had only one of my four engine outs be, be filmed, but I turned that into, you know, like, um, since it wasn't really my fault, I didn't, I, and we really never really figured out what was wrong. I, I wanted to have that be something that people would go, you know what, okay, this, this, this could happen. You know, this is something that could happen to you, but if you see the video, you know, I'm not like freaking out or anything like that or whatever, you know, I'm just, I'm doing what I was trained to do. You got an engine out you start looking for a place to land right away, you know, and you fly the airplane first. Engine out means that you're going to probably be flying level. And so what happens is as soon as you're flying level and you know, have no power forward, you're going to start to fall out of the sky. So you got to point the airplane down and get your speed back again and get, get, fly, get the airplane flying again. And at the same time, you're looking for a place to land. Fortunately, that day, I was actually investigating um, possible emergency landing areas. And I thought, oh, I'll just go over there and check that one out. Well, I was close enough to it to just barely make it. And uh, uh, everything worked out fine. And I was able to figure out a way to get the airplane back that day and all that kind of stuff. My legacy of, of what I'm leaving behind is not do what you've always dreamed about doing. And it's never too late to start. I took 40 plus years off before I flew after I was a, a teenager. When I came back to flying an airplane, there was something inside of me and said, I've got to do this, you know? And there was no no in me. There was no don't do it. There was no stop. There was no waiting. I just went and did it. And so I think that that's, that's, that's an important factor for anybody. And please don't take 40 years you know, to, to make that decision. <clears throat> Um, it just worked out for me that way. Um, I think I'm a young spirit. Um, I still have a few more years left in me to, to, to fly. You know, I've told a few people that are like, well, this is probably the last time I get my engine rebuilt, you know, <laughs> but I'll have three or four, maybe five years more left. But if I'm still 80 and I'm still flying and I'm still physically able to, I probably will be doing it, you know? <laughs> so, um, and being a contractor like I am, you know, I'm still active every day. I, I, I build things, I'm up on roofs, I'm climbing ladders, you name it, I do that. Um, I want to have that be a part of my legacy to people who are older also to say, you know what, I'm going to get out there and do something today, you know, instead of sitting around and not doing anything at all. It keeps you in shape, keeps your mind in shape, all these kinds of things. It's never too late to start to, to, to fulfill a dream or, a, or something that you've been thinking about your whole life. I mean, I, I hear some stories every once in a while. It's, well, yeah, I just, I just finally decided once I retired to do this thing. And what's the, what's the worst part about retiring? Is that you retire, you know, become very tired and you, you, you know, you get the gold watch and you, you know, die two, like two years later, you know, kind of thing. So, um, I don't know what's in, the, in store for me in the future. I really don't know, other than this path that I'm on and some ideas that I've got going on and, and, and you know, I wanna build a house out on our property and stuff like that. You know, those are not little things that, you know, you can do in an afternoon. Those are things you gotta plan, you gotta, you gotta work, you gotta do it, you gotta have the money to do it, you gotta raise it, all that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, I, I look back on my, my mom and dad as being from the airlines and a stewardess and a, and a captain for United Airlines. And the fact that my mom went on to, to fly airplanes that, you know, maybe there's something in my blood, I don't know. <laughs>